Chapter two, workplace safety and wellness. Okay, you, your patients, and their families can experience various degrees of stress and grief during the and following a medical emergency. To fulfill your duties as an emergency medical responder, you need to be in good physical condition. You should have a complete physical exam to ensure that you are healthy enough to do your job. Okay, you must learn to avoid unnecessary stress and prevent your stress levels from getting too high. Most stressful calls include a patient who reminds you of a close family member, very young or very old patients, critically ill or injured patients, and obviously death and people dying. Right, most stressful calls include um, unusual dangers like attacks, assaults, um, mass casualty incidents involving things like airplanes, trains, where there's large spread carnage, okay, violence, riots, and things like that, unusual sights and smells and sounds, things of burning, uh, chemicals, things like that, and obviously mass casualties, like I said just now, with your planes, trains, and automobiles, multiple injuries, multiple casualties. You must take a conscious effort to prevent and reduce stress. Learn to recognize the signs and symptoms of this stress and adjust your lifestyle accordingly. Um, things like walks in nature, going to the movies, friends, having friends around, going out with friends, just relaxing, doing breathing exercises, yoga, and meditation, things like that. Learn which services and resources are available to you. There might be a psychiatrist that you could see a psychologist or a wellness clinic or something like that. Grief and reaction triggers. Death of a loved one often makes your mind go off the deep end. It also takes you back to scenes where you had people that have died around you before. Okay, and bring back memories that you don't necessarily want to have out or things you've been suppressing maybe. Major injuries or traumatic experiences could also bring these things in, PTSD and that type of things as well. Serious illness, drug, alcohol addiction, incarceration, these things could all cause major, major triggers of grief and things. A sudden end in a relationship, a divorce, death, major personal reduction, loss of job or income, loss of status or identity. These type of things can all lead to these things. There are five recognized stages or reactions to death and dying. Firstly, denial. The person experiencing the denial cannot believe what is happening. They were together with somebody and all of a sudden they're all alone now. Things like that. They just it can't come to terms with it. Then anger. Anger is a normal reaction to stress and will sometimes be directed at you. Not purposefully. But people become upset and they react and they, they, they the way they react can't be um, ever judged or anything like that. You can never judge a person properly as to, what, as to what's going to happen. There's a good chance they're going to try and bargain <laughs> and make um, a deal to postpone death and dying and things like that. Can't you do something to help him? Can't you? Just in a little while, no, uh, sometimes you can't do these things. Now, depression patient is usually silent and seems to retreat into his, his or own, her own world. One has to remember and think of depression. It's like a giant blanket. The longer you sit still, the more it starts to cover you and cover you and cover you until the patient is gone completely and completely smothered and involved in deep down depression, lost, locked away in the depths of a cell somewhere. Acceptance, as soon as the patient accepts, and understands that death and dying cannot be changed. Birth, taxes, and death are three things about humans you cannot ever change. Always will be. Um, and it helps you to, to understand these things. Okay, recognizing stress. There are always certain triggers that, that, that you can recognize when people are under stress. Irritability. irritability. When your normal level-handed friend all of a sudden snaps at you for no reason, something that is a joke or something. The inability to concentrate, pacing up and down, um, wringing of hands, things like that. Changing normal disposition, 
those people that are normally all very cheerful and happy and things like that, they seem sad and mopey and those kind of things. Nightmares or sleeping disorders or insomnia is keeping us up at night. Ne? Anxiety um, and even anxiety attacks and palpitations, things like that. Indecisiveness, inability to make a decision, go or stay, get up, get down, anything like that. And obviously signs of guilt and, and things. Um, those are all things we need to be aware of. Okay. But the more on the loss of, of, of the stress, recognizing stress, the loss of appetite or binge eating. Okay. A two liter ice cream that you sit down and look at again and the bowl is empty. Um, Lots of interest in your work, your friends, your social behaviors, things like that. Isolation, like I said, isolation. If a person has depression, got to get up and move, got to get out into the sunshine. Sunshine causes vitamin D, vitamin D lifts our spirits. A little bit of exercise lifts our um, serotonin levels, endorphins, things like that, and brings us through. Obviously, there's always a chance of, of, of drug and alcohol abuse and things like that. And then sometimes even physical symptoms like pains and aches and illnesses, nausea and vomiting, those can be a sign of stress. Okay, um, we need to eat a healthy, healthy, balanced diet as well. We, we really need to make sure that we, um, we just look after ourselves, eh? We just look after ourselves. It just helps everybody to, to be on the page all the time, it's, it's beautiful. Yes. Um, you can either be your biggest friend or your biggest enemy. All right, stress management. Preventing stress it helps to drink large amounts of water, not overdoing it. Just every day, avoid too much caffeine, avoid Alcohol, especially if you know that you're in a stressful situation, be merry, learn to, to balance your lifestyle, um, put enough um, time aside for self-reflection, quiet time, meditation if necessary, but yoga, yeah, as you get older, maybe a bit of Tai Chi or something like that, Dong Kwai, uh, Qigong, one of those kind of things. Okay. Preventing stress, uh, stress uh, it does help to spend time with your family and your friends, especially those you get along with, so that you get along with well, you know. Hobbies, um, mm. things that you can do that have got nothing to do with your work, absolutely zero. Um, hiking or mountain biking or something like that, something that gets you out, get a bit of fresh air in your lungs. It takes, a, it takes your mind off things. And exercising, we've just been talking about meditation, yoga, um, qigong, and then obviously psychologists, psychiatrists, things like that, even your GP, help you with certain stresses and strains. Reducing that you may benefit from mental health professional, like I said, psychologists or psychiatrists, who can listen to you and understand what you're going through. Okay, critical identity uh, uh, incident stress management is a comprehensive stress uh, management program. Let's talk about that um, through some of the public safety departments and things like that, especially if you're in America, those things are available to you. CRM is a way that uh, team members work together with leader to develop and maintain shared understanding of its emergency situation. In a loud and often hectic environment of EMS, it is easy for errors to occur when you believe there's an immediate or potential problem brought to the team leader's uh, attention. Use pace, probe, alert, challenge an emergency. Keep yourself awake and keep yourself on your toes. You will encounter a wide variety of hazards and emergency scenes. It is important for you to recognize these hazards and take steps to minimize the risks of these that post your patients, yourself, and your partners. Remember, your own safety is paramount in these situations. Um, I always think of, of things like um, look, listen, think, connect. We need to be doing a constant um, threat analysis 
to decide whether you're safe or there are any dangers that are occurring or developing around you. Always look around you 360 degrees and try and establish what's going on. Listen, listen for things that are happening around you and then only think about it and act. Obviously, the ongoing risk assessment is an ongoing thing. It's not just a once-off. Keep it in your head going all the time, always looking for dangers, always looking for hazards. Things change at the drop of a hat. Um, when we look at hazards, we must always remember infectious diseases. There are things like bacteria and viruses and fungi that when they get into your body will multiply and possibly kill you. They spread from one person to another, and we need to understand how these things spread so we can protect ourselves. Usually, um, substance, body substance isolation or BSR would be a good way of doing it, using PPE, gloves, masks, uh, face shields, goggles, things like that, uh, aprons and plastic overall things if you need them. In recent years, we've had an outbreak of a whole lot of more diseases, um, things like COVID-19 all of a sudden, um, SARS, SARS, HIV, uh, AIDS, TB, hepatitis, N1, H1, all those kind of things. Always dangerous, 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 dangerous. The most common routes of transmission are obviously direct contact with infectious agents. Indirect contact, in other words, airborne droplets or contact with infected blood. Direct contact, um, obviously the high staph bacteria is spread to direct contact. Most MRSA infections occur in health care settings, such as hospitals, dialysis centers, and um, nursing homes. These are like almost super bugs, and they seem to get into people where there's uh, weakened immune systems. Healthy people otherwise come up with a type of skin rash. And as an emergency medical responder, we need to follow standard precautions to avoid contacting MRSA. Airborne pathogens, infectious diseases that are spread through indirect contact, airborne droplets, uh, seasonal influenza, COVID-19, tuberculosis, severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, uh, most SARS, Middle East secure, uh, um, respiratory syndrome, uh, they spread through tiny droplets in the atmosphere uh, when a person coughs or sneezes or whatever the case might be. All these things are in the germs in the in the in the, in the sputum or the, uh, the 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 mucus that's transmitted or blown out through the nose or the mouth or whatever. That's why we should wear a, a decent mask, covering and preventing some of these infections. Some people say masks don't work. Um, but they seem to work pretty well in certain situations. Don't touch the mask and then touch your face. Remember, the mask will be contaminated when you get rid of the mask in a very orderly and controlled way to avoid getting contact on the skin. Bloodborne pathogens are obviously infectious microorganisms in the organisms in the blood. And viruses cause HIV, AIDS, hepatitis, B and C. Uh, HIV, HPV, all these kind of things, these six really nasty ones. Uh, there's no evidence of transmission by contact with other body fluids unless well visible in blood. Exposure can place by, take place with blood splashed or spraying into your eyes, nose, mouth, open, open wounds. Okay, if you have blood with a patient on your hands and you touch your eyes, nose, mouth, or broken skin. A needle that is used to inject the patient breaks your skin, so it's a needle stick infection. Or broken glass at the scene of an incident covered with infected patient's blood and penetrates your glove or your skin and gets in. Some of the HIV patients don't even know they're infected. They have not uh, symptoms. HIV can take months, even years, to get in, develop into full-blown illness and sickness. Okay, that's why we should always take precautions. We should always be wearing our gloves. Always be using goggles or face masks and um, face shields when there is any use of blood or danger of getting blood on your body or any type of things. Hepatitis B is uh, far more contagious than HIV, far more contagious. And you need to get to, uh, if, especially if you're working with blood on a regular basis, even if it's just an irregular basis. A hepatitis B vac should be the top of your list. Things like medicine meningitis and syphilis and things like that can also be spread with contaminated blood. 
Okay. We need to use the standard precautions. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, encourage you to move away from latex gloves. You start using nitrile gloves, blue gloves, black gloves. They're much thicker. Uh, they're much better protection for your skin. Always wear a mask and the eye shield, as I said before. And if you do get blood, always wash yourself off with some soap and warm water um, as quickly as possible, as soon as possible. Okay, do not recap needles or cut bend needles. Use them. Place them in a sharps container. The, the less chance you have of sticking yourself, the better it is for you. Hey? Um, always remember the steps taken by the CDC, Center for Disease Control, Occupational Health and Safety Act are very specific, especially when it comes to certain outbreaks in certain places. You need to be aware of community outbreaks like measles, um, uh, in certain areas or uh, cholera or things like that in certain places, halfway and those kind of things. Upon assessing a patient, it's not as far away as possible that you can actually do an assessment without coming into contact with them, without them sneezing or coughing on you. Inquire about influenza, para-influenza, COVID-19, other things like that. Perform hand hygiene before and after patients. Wash, wash, wash. Uh, LFE method, wash between your fingers, wash around your hands, your fingernails, things like that. Disposable face mask, remember I said, don't touch them with your hands, don't contaminate, cross-contaminate your own skin when removing face masks and things like that. Use of eye protection, cleanable goggles, disposable face shields, you know, like just a face shield, a plastic sheet down in front of your face. Okay, that at least protects your face and eyes, lips, things like that, nasal passages. So there's less chance of things getting in across those things. The use of PPE, personal protective equipment, you need to be able to remove gloves once they're full of blood without getting blood on yourselves. If you have a ripped or torn one, they need to be replaced straight away. Um, correct size gloves should always be used. Some people have a problem. I know personally, my hands are extra big, so my gloves, I have to find extra large or extra strong gloves that I can put my hands into. Usually the black ones, as I say, work very well because they're stretchy. They're more stretchy than the latex type of gloves. Okay. Um, removal of gloves will be a skill that will be a skill that will be tested on you. Uh, we will be shown how to remove them properly. Um, Removal of face mask and things like that is also vital. Wash your hands, warm water, soap, or using alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Immunizations for, for, for rescuers or medical personnel are advisable. Um, things like uh, tetanus, hepatitis B vaccine, things like that. And if there's things like chickenpox, varicella, uh, varicella um, vaccines or your measles, mumps, and rubella. Uh, tuberculin testing can also be recommended. Um, all those things trying to help keep you healthy, keep you one step ahead of the pack when it comes to your general immunity. Okay, responding to a scene. Remember, once you respond to a scene, the first thing is hazards. Hazards, hazards, hazards. H. H stands for hazards. All that includes your safety and then the other people on the scene. An injured or dead emergency responder cannot help those at all. In fact, it just causes extra problems, put more people's lives in danger. If you uh, um, move into an incident in a vehicle, ensure your safety, always drive at a reasonable speed, make sure that your lights are visible, and always, always, always wear a seatbelt. Okay. Your dispatch will inform you um, of anticipated hazards, either from uh, via a message or via radio, transmission or call and might help you determine your approach to the scene. Okay. Once you um, in your vehicle, fasten your seatbelt, your best route plan, um, some of these maps, uh, ways or Google Maps or things like that might be able to give you a quicker route to the scene if there's a blockage or something like that. Um, generally, no, it's been put on a tablet or on a mobile device. Parking your vehicle. Park your vehicle so that it protects the area, say, from traffic hazards. Park it in a fend-off position. In other words, put your nose into the middle of the street so if somebody does drive into you, 
They won't have to veer away from your vehicle. Your vehicle will be a buffer and stop the people from riding into you. Always ensure that you have lights on, hazards on, put out cones, strobe lights, things like that to make you more visible to people around you. People stop thinking when they're driving past an accident scene. They just drive into you. They have no brains in that situation. They're always more important, more uh, interested in what's going on around them than actually driving a vehicle properly at that point in time. Okay, uh, reflective vests and things like that is always a very good idea when working in a, a high traffic zone, highways or whatever the case might be. If your vehicle is not needed, park it off the road. Get out of the street. It's always a good thing. All right, now once you arrive on scene, it's good to do a scene survey. Check what's going on around you. Park at a distance and move through the scene. Okay, sometimes it might be necessary to control the flow of traffic, park your vehicle in there, fend off position and get assistance. Make sure there's cones and lights. Violence or crime in crime scenes or things like that. If you are trained in law enforcement procedures, follow your protocols for law enforcement. If not, proceed very carefully. Okay, if you have any doubts about your safety, get out, wait at a safe distance, request help from the police. If a scene becomes is, is a crime scene, do not move anything. If you need to move something to get to your patient, take a picture of before and after and try and handle the things that you move as little as possible so that you don't contaminate any evidence on those things. Okay, obviously where there's crowds and masses of people, you may not be able to get in in a hurry. You may not want to leave your car. Okay, Respect for, uh, request crowd control and um, stay in your vehicle. Do not get out. Stay where you are. With electrical hazards and it's unsafe to approach a scene, don't be a euro. Electricity kills, especially high tension wires, things like that. Do not touch those things. Be very careful. When it comes to hazmat and chemicals and things like that, always remember that acid and alkaline bases, fuel, diesel, all those things are all highly flammable, highly toxic and deadly. Okay. If you're trained in the use of different things, ensure that you have the correct equipment with you if you need to fight fires or get to a patient but you need something like a fireproof something, jacket material, whatever the case might be, fire extinguishers. If there's vehicles involved where there are hazmat warning triangles on, know the type of triangle, know the type of hazmat that you should be uh, coming into contact with. Um, if you find a truck with an orange disc or diamond on the front, inside the window should be an orange box containing material safety sheets data sheets um, telling you about exactly what is in the vehicle and if it comes into contact with your skin, how to treat it and things like that. Okay, if you believe that crash may involve hazardous materials, stop uphill, upwind, use binoculars or just, uh, just keep a distance, okay? Odors and fumes can be very toxic. Call for hazards, uh, hazmat, call for help. Unstable vehicles, trees, poles, buildings, cliffs, anything that could fall on you or move while you're working with it, it's not advisable to be there. Okay, I've seen some crazy things in my time. Cars parked up lamp poles and things like that. There we go, we're talking about that right now. Mabel, vehicles may be needed to be stabilized before the patient can be extracted. Undeployed airbags are always a hazard. They come out at about 200 odd kilometers an hour, if I remember correctly. Fires and explosions can re result in unstable buildings. Just look at 9 11. Okay. Always sharp objects are involved, whether it's metal, glass, whatever it is, with vehicle incidents, accidents. Okay. Always wear heavy firefighting leather or firefighting gloves. Um, when dealing with sharp objects, wear your latex or not your nitro gloves inside those gloves if need be. Okay. When we're assessing the scene for dangers, remember even a pet can become a violent animal. Okay. We're not even talking about wild animals here, yeah, your normal dog, cat, 
Um, okay, I'm not really going as far as hamsters, but definitely other things can become very dangerous. Okay, and should be secured as another, another way, part away from the house, like where you are. Okay, may present hazards such as biting, kicking, or even trampling. Listen, horses and things like that can be nasty as well. Obviously, if you're working in um, an environment um, in certain parts of the world, it can be exceptionally hot, 50, 60 degrees. It can also be exceptionally cold, minus 50, minus 60 degrees. And then there's always wet and windy conditions to make things even worse. Keep your patients dry and as comfortable as possible. Use emergency lighting when operating in the dark. Have space blankets and thermal things to keep your patients and yourself warm. Okay. Special conditions, water rescue, ice rescue, and things like that, confined spaces, below grade, underground, in other words, terrorism and mass casualty incidents all um, add extra danger in the scene. Okay, do not enter an emergency situation unless it is safe to do so and you've had the proper training and proper equipment to do so. Um, with patients that are unstable, psychologically unstable, they're a hazard as well. Don't forget them.